Jesus had many important and vital things to say to his disciples. And he has done so since the Passover meal has ended. And Judas has departed, who is on his way to betray Jesus while this conversation in John 14 through 16 is ongoing. Now the last teachings of Jesus are just about over uh, and will be over at the conclusion of John 16. His final words, uh, as you can tell from the scripture reading, have to do with where he is uh, going and what is going to happen shortly. And that will begin, by the way, in a matter of hours from the time these words are spoken. He says, first, a little while, and you will not see me, and then you will see me. After his death and burial, they did not see him. And then, well, uh, they did not see him from Friday afternoon, uh, just before sunset, until sometime on Sunday after he arose from the dead. And then after 40 days, he would go to be with the Father permanently. He did not ascend to the Father prior to then, however, for uh, he, had, uh, he said he had not. In John 20, in verse 17, he told Mary, Do not cling to me, I have not yet ascended to the Father. He had been in the Hadean realm, uh, in the paradise section of it, just where he promised the thief on the cross he would be. And this is a, a diagram to explain what happens upon death and how that all go to the Hadean realm, either to paradise or to torments, uh, where from which they will emerge on the day of judgment to enter into either heaven or hell. No one from the torment section will enter into heaven. No one in the paradise section will be cast into hell at that time. Uh, but this is uh, what happens as described by Jesus in Luke chapter 16. However, his apostles did not understand exactly what he was saying at this time. And so he explained that shortly he would be taken from them and they would weep and uh, lament because of it. Vincent says that the word weep refers to audible weeping as the crying of children. And uh, if you don't think that's loud, you haven't heard one cry while we're meeting. Uh, they can seem louder than you would ever imagine. But that's the kind of crying, and that is distinguished as simply shedding tears or weeping silently. So during this time, the world would rejoice. They would rejoice because Jesus had been put to death. The Jewish leaders would rejoice. Anyone that Jesus had ever caused to feel guilty would rejoice. You know, Jesus taught the same thing about the sanctity of marriage that John had. John had been cast into prison and lost his life over what he taught. Jesus did not, but those who hated what John said no more favored what Jesus said than John because they taught the same doctrine. Those who prefer darkness instead of light certainly rejoiced upon Jesus' death. Those who practice lawlessness and engage in wickedness undoubtedly felt relieved that Jesus was dead. Certainly unbelievers did. Here's the way that the pulpit commentary put this. The world will rejoice because to some extent it will be the world's doing. And it will fancy for a little while that it has got its way. 
and succeeded excellently well. The world will roll a stone to his sepulcher and make it as sure as they can, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Phariseeism will exult that this demand for a higher righteousness than its own has forever hushed. Sadduceeism will rejoice that this troublesome witness to unseen and eternal things is silenced. The hierarchy will boast that now no danger prevails of the Romans taking away their place and their nation. Remember how the high priest had said something about that prior uh, to these events? The world will praise the deed of blood, but all of this rejoicing will only last a little while. Then the sorrow of the apostles will turn into joy when Jesus is resurrected. So this is the way that things are going to occur. Now, let's pick up where we left off in the scripture reading with John 16, verses 21 and 22, because Jesus uh, gives an illustration of what the apostles are about to undergo. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remens, uh, remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. So that is the illustration, that of a woman giving birth. It is sorrowful. It is exceedingly sorrowful. There is exceeding travail in bringing forth a new human being. But that sorrow is turned into joy. That is somewhat comparable to what the apostles were going to undergo. We, uh, if it were not for this illustration, I don't know if we would know what deep sorrow they experienced when Jesus was crucified. But this helps to explain it. Now let's look at uh, verses 23 and 24. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask in the Father, uh, the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. That day, as used in this passage, is not the resurrection, but Pentecost. That is, they will not ask Jesus questions. From that point on, they will ask the Father to help. Up to now, they had asked Jesus concerning things, but now they would be asking the Father in his name which is the reason that we pray as we do. Jesus would no longer be with them. He would have gone on into heaven, ascended up into heaven. They would be with him as they watched him ascend into heaven. And from then on, they would be asking the Father in the name of Jesus for the things that they desired. Now let's read verse 25. <clears throat> These things I have spoken to you in a figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you. Well, let's read verse 27 also. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. And have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world again. I leave the world and go to my Father. The promise here in verse 25 is one of openness. Up to now, Jesus had often spoken figuratively to them, metaphorically 
in dark sayings, as it were, and they oftentimes did not understand. They had to ask him a few times, would you explain the parable to us? But he would now speak to them plainly after the resurrection, and they would understand what he was saying. He would, especially through the Holy Spirit, speak to them plainly after Pentecost. This is a, a, a dividing line that we see after Pentecost. Jesus ascends into heaven. They don't have personal contact with him anymore. But they have the comforter that he sent. And he will explain things to them. He will uh, inspire them. They will speak the word of God. And they will have answers to all of their questions. In that day, they will pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, and they will, uh, the Father will answer them. Why? Because he loves them. Why does the Father love them? Two reasons are cited. Number one, because they love him. And number two, they believe that Jesus came forth from him, that he came from heaven to earth, that the Father sent him. Now, we know that from other verses that we have found in the, in the book of John, just as one example in John 6 and verse 57, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. And uh, there are other times where it is very clear that Jesus said, I have come forth from the Father, or the Father sent me. And of course here, he has been talking about returning to the Father, going to be with the Father. The Father sent him into the world, and it'll only be a few weeks before Jesus does ascend and return to the Father in heaven. Now let's read the final verses of John chapter 16. Beginning with verse 29, his disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from the Father. However, what are you expecting in the next verse to read? Well, if you haven't already read this and are very familiar with it, you may still be surprised by how Jesus answers them. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. After the apostles have given this wonderful affirmation of faith, now we know, now we know, Jesus does something totally unexpected. He immediately challenges them on what they have just said. Isn't that peculiar? He's about to be crucified. He, he has been with them all this time. They finally say, yes, we, we understand. And Jesus basically says, no, you don't. Isn't that odd, wouldn't you think? They thought they had it all figured out. But as Johnson put it, they did not even understand what they did not understand. They thought they did, but they did not. Furthermore, they would all flee when Jesus was taken captive, which is a 
Tremendous example, by the way, of 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. They would pass most every other test that they would ever face with flying colors, but they would fail the one they faced that very evening. They would flee. This probably haunted them for a long time. However, as they came to understand things, they would ex understand better their own actions. They probably did not understand why Jesus said these words to them at the time. They had no intention of fleeing him. They had no intention of deserting him. In fact, had not Peter said, I will die with you? And had all, not all the others said the same thing, echoing what Peter said? But despite all of those professions of profound faith, when the time came, they fled. But God would see them through this difficult time, a time they could not comprehend fully at the moment, but later they would. Now Jesus concludes by saying that as long as you are in the world, you will have tribulation. But I have overcome the world. So if we overcome through Christ, we too can overcome the world. And by the way, this is a contrast, isn't it? In the world, you have tribulation, but in Christ, you have peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives it, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. From John 14 and verse 27. So his final comment, before his prayer, and that's chapter 17, his final comment is to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. He has overcome the world throughout his life. He has not been tempted. Satan tried to tempt him very early uh, after he was baptized. He uh, tempted him with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Jesus was not tempted. Satan could not offer enough kingdoms to tempt him. And they had tried to destroy him. They had tried to get him to sin. They had tried to get him in trouble. They had tried to catch him in his words. They had failed, failed, failed. And he will not fail on the cross either. He will come through and overcome even the total adverse situation that he was facing, the treatment that they gave him. This would be outrageous for anyone. In fact, we read it and, and we almost want to say, stop it. You're killing an innocent man. You're killing of the only man who is not worthy of death. And if we had it in our power, we might want to stop it. But then we would not have salvation. And Jesus knew that. So he endured even the unfair treatment that he received at the cross. And now, afterward, he is going to the Father. And we can go through him. Now, let's find out how you go to the Father. Well, actually, this is what we've been discussing all the way through, is it not? Have we not been seeing what pleases the Father, what the Father loves, what uh, precepts Jesus has been teaching all through chapters 14 through 16? Number one is to believe that Jesus came from the Father. Many people do not understand this. 
There are religions that say, oh, we think Jesus was a great prophet, but we don't think he came from the Father. Well, if you don't think that, you can't be saved. Jesus came from the Father. The Father sent him. He is the Word made flesh. He is God in the flesh. He revealed God to the world. Most of them didn't like it, but he revealed the very nature of God to all. If we do not believe that Jesus came from the Father, there is no hope of salvation. None. And those who uh, are atheists, those who are in other religions that reject Christ, have no hope. This is absolutely crucial and fundamental to believe that Jesus came from the Father. Number two, we must love Jesus and the Father. How many times have we heard, if you love me, you will keep my commandments or some form of that throughout these three chapters? And love is not just with words, as we talked about in class this morning. It is easy to say, I love God. It is easy to uh, talk about it. It's, it's easy to uh, tell others, I love Jesus, I love the Father. The Pharisees and the Sadducees said that. They loved God, but they didn't show it with their actions. Likewise, we must be careful that we do not just say it, rather than do it and practice it. Number three, we must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if any of you uh, have heard this story, and I don't know how much of it is true yet, but it is alleged that a Muslim professor at Rollins College said that uh, the resurrection of Christ is not true. Now, I have heard a lot of criticism about the student, but I haven't heard that she denied this. Maybe she has, but I haven't seen it. And I even wrote to uh, Scott Maxwell, who did a story on this, and I asked him, why has this not been verified? He was talking about reporters go and get facts. Oh, I agree. So why hasn't it been said that she didn't say this? or confirm that she did. If I were a reporter, that's one thing I would, you know, get right into right away. No, they do not believe in the resurrection of Christ, and you cannot be saved. Why, why would you do anything in Christianity? Why would you be baptized if Christ is not raised from the dead? You know what the appropriate picture is, you stay in the water. Instead of being raised up with Christ. If Christ is not raised up, you don't get raised up. You have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number four, abide in Jesus rather than in the world. You know, this is, this is tough. You can be convicted of Jesus coming from the Father. You can be convicted of the resurrection of Christ. And you can be, take a firm stand in that and say, I know this, I believe this. But you know, it's a lot tougher to live every day abiding in Jesus rather than in the world because the world is around us on every side. We, see the, we hear the world's music. We hear uh, the world's, uh, uh, or, or see the world's movies sometimes. We see the world's television shows. We hear conversations that are worldly. It's everywhere. It's not easy to ignore the world and not abide in the world. But we need to abide in Jesus. Number five, we must keep his commandments, which includes loving one another. We talked about that uh, several times 
uh, from John 13, uh, 34 and 35, uh, 15, 12 and 13. Uh, that is crucial and is part of the, the first two greatest commandments. First is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Many people are big on the first one, but kind of want to skimp on the second one. Can't do that. That is absolutely essential if you want to go to the Father. Number six, be a servant. You know, that was uh, illustrated in a number of ways, but the one way we won't ever forget is when Jesus wrapped the towel around him and wash the disciples' feet. We can talk about being a servant and serving one another all day long, but nothing says it more eloquently than that example. Be a servant. We are here not just to enjoy ourselves, but we're here to help others. And Jesus left heaven to be a servant, and that is our responsibility as well. And then number seven, trust in the complete revelation of God. The apostles would eventually have that. They didn't have it yet when Jesus was betrayed. They talked with him for a period of 40 days after his resurrection. Yes, that's all true. But they still did not understand everything until the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost. And from that point on, they revealed all of the word of God. And it has all been revealed. Remember, that was the promise. He will guide you into what? All truth. Was that done? Yes, he has granted unto us, 2 Peter 1, 3, all things that pertain to life and godliness. These people who keep coming along saying, I have more, there's more revelation, are lying or else are deceived. It is all here. And this, as we talked about in class this morning, is what we're going to be judged by. This is what we're going to be judged by. Not by our own thoughts, not by what somebody else says, but by the living word of God, which is complete and thorough. It tells us everything that we need to know. And if you want to go to the Father, this is how you get there. By reading, studying, meditating, and following what is written in this book. You begin that journey, as we said a minute ago, if you believe by repenting of your sins and being baptized with Jesus Christ to wash away your sins. But don't worry, you won't be left in the water because Jesus was raised up and so will you be too. To walk in newness of life and to begin your journey toward heaven and the ultimate goal of going to the Father. If you have started that journey but have turned back for whatever reason, perhaps because of things in the world that you have allowed to get to you, now is the time to come back from that also and get on the right track. If we can help you in any of these ways, let us know while we stand and while we sing.